What's that? The smartest person in any room, anywhere, a defense of Elon Musk. Ha, huh, sounds interesting. Let's take a look at an idea from the smartest man in any room, anywhere. You know, because I'm sure they would never be at the level of a, I know, copying ideas of a failed, scammy Kickstarter. And am I being led to believe that this thing is some sort of thing? Yes, it's a thing, a real thing. And clean energy is only its primary function. Grab a notepad, because this is where it gets interesting. Like I know, say for instance, solar roadways. For those in the north, the panels use energy they collect to power elements to keep the surface temperature a few degrees above freezing. They're heated. No more ice and snow on roads causing traffic delays, accidents, and injury. No more shoveling your driveway and sidewalk or wasting tax money on snow removal. <laughs> yes, yes. Why waste money on snow plows when you could waste 10 times that much energy by melting the snow? Plus, seeing all the heat comes from the sun in the first place, doesn't the mere fact that there's loads of snow on the ground meaning that you're not getting a lot of solar irradiance? Hold my beer, says Elon Musk. I can sell this stupidity for tens of thousands of dollars to idiots and still have them think that I'm Techno Ponzi Rocket Jesus. I mean, these are the sort of brilliant ideas of wearing your underpants on the outside to save on laundry bills. Yes, Elon Musk came up with the brilliant idea of heating solar shingles so they can remain snow free and continue generating electricity in winter. Brilliant idea. Why didn't someone think of this sooner? Oh, hang on. Maybe there is some painfully obvious reason why this is stupid. As a rule of thumb, you yeah, don't put solar panels very far north because you don't get as much sunlight over the year. And you definitely don't put them in somewhere that gets lots of snow. I mean, it's like putting a condom machine in the Vatican. Look, this is the Earth-Sun system. And if I come around to a point here where you're looking with the sun directly behind you at the face of the Earth, Every point on that disc in front of you gets exactly the same amount of light. So this is America in the morning when it's not getting much light. You know, the, so the actual total area on the disc is relatively small. And this is what it looks like at midday in America in summertime. So you yeah, get lots of solar energy in America in the summertime. But now let's take a look at what that's like in winter, shall we? You know, because the Earth's actually on a, a tilted axis. So, you know, six months apart, you'll see something very different if you take the exact same view, with the sun behind you looking at the Earth. And now, all of a sudden, the disk that you're looking at, America doesn't occupy that much space on it, which means it's not getting as much solar energy. And when you're well far north, you're virtually getting nothing. In fact, you know, you get up into the Arctic Circle and you get none. Which is a fancy way of saying, in winter, the days are shorter and it gets colder. And it's typically more cloudy, blah, blah, blah. Which is why places like California are fantastic for solar panels. Whereas you get further north to like, you know, where it snows and the such like, they become really stupid places to put solar panels. Because the cost of the installation is exactly the same and they're only going to generate a fraction of the power. So you guessed it, yes. Places that get lots of snow tend to be the worst places in the world to put solar panels. In fact, in such places, you're probably better off, you know, if you want to save energy in the environment, in leaving the snow on your roof as an insulator, such that your house doesn't bleed as much energy away into the environment. You know what the dumbest thing to do in such a situation would be to melt all that snow off your roof, which is effectively directly heating up the environment. <laughs> you know, why bother with insulation when you can put the heating elements on the outside of your house? And then after you put this colossal amount of energy in to melt the snow, now your house is less well insulated than it was before. Yeah, sounds like the smartest guy in the room to me. But wait, it's well known that in winter, you can simply with the human eyeball see who's got good insulation on their houses and who doesn't, just by seeing which roofs melt the snow the quickest. I mean, surely there's not going to be someone out there who is proud that their house has the worst 
insulation in the neighborhood. And there's no way that in 2021, it could pick up the best part of a million hits and a 90 something percent approval rating. When you compare it to the rest of the neighbors, you can see there's all snow covered roofs in the entire neighborhood. And then the one Tesla roof here that is completely clear. Yes, that's entirely correct. Just look at all those fantastically insulated roofs all across your neighborhood, apart from the one terribly insulated roof. Who was made by, who was it again? And the one Tesla roof here that is completely clear. But wait, there's an upside, right? Those can now generate solar power. And would be generating solar energy right now. Uh, yes, no, they would be generating lots of solar energy if it wasn't cloudy and it wasn't the middle of winter when the days are short and America is really far north. So the solar panels are going to be at a really unfavorable angle. Let's take another coarse grain look at this. This is going to be the Earth. And the Earth, of course, is bathed in solar irradiance coming from the sun. And the sun's so far away, that these are effectively parallel lines. And the whole idea of solar panels is to catch as much of that solar radiation as possible using solar panels, and you want to use the least number possible. So obviously, if you angle your solar panels at a stupid angle like this, well, now you're using about twice as much solar panels, but you're only capturing the same amount of solar flux. So what this means in practice is if you're at the equator, the solar panels basically look like a tabletop. And if you're at the top of the Earth, then you can capture, in principle, the same amount of energy by having your solar panels upright like that, essentially the side of your house. And you know, if you exclude things like the atmosphere, it will attenuate things a little, and it's cloudy up north in winter, yeah, minor technical things, then the if the cross-section is the same, in principle, you capture the same amount of energy. Now, of course, what this means in practice is if you want to have a solar farm at the equator, it requires a fixed amount of space. And if you want to have that same amount of space up further north for your solar farm, now it occupies a much bigger area of land. It occupies this much land versus this much land. So basically, it, it almost, it, you go, the land occupation goes up by a factor of about two to generate the same amount of power once you get up to temperate latitudes. Also worth bearing in mind is the Earth's axial tilt. So if this is parallel to the sunlight, and this is 90 degrees to it, the Earth's actual tilt is... 25 degrees, it, it's this sort of angle. So in summertime, the North Pole is over here somewhere, and this is the tip of the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle is going to be around there somewhere. And uh, in winter, this will be the, the, the edge of the Arctic Circle, which is just at the very top of the Earth there. So what does all this mean for building houses? Well, if you're building a nice little house with a solar roof, you know, roughly sort of at the equator, it captures a certain cross-section of sunlight. And of course, once you get up to the temperate latitude, you build that same house. And what you find is the amount of solar energy that it captures is down to about half. And almost all of it is captured on one side of the house with the other side capturing almost nothing. And this is why, of course, solar panels in temperate latitudes are generally only on one side of the house. At which point you have to ask yourself, with this Tesla roof, did they seriously put solar panels on all parts of the roof, including the bit where it generates almost no power? And did they really put enough energy into that or have such poor insulation that it melts the snow even on the part of the roof that isn't going to generate any power. When you compare it to the rest of the neighbors, you can see there's all snow covered roofs in the entire neighborhood. And then the one Tesla roof here that is completely clear. And yeah, on that video, it makes it look very much like the roof melted 
all of the snow in that if it had just sort of melted a little bit and the rest had just slid off the roof, you would have giant piles of snow at the foot of the building. Let me flip this around. You can see there are, there's not too much here at all. Now I should stress that this happened this year and there's no signs that these panels are heated in any way whatsoever. It's just that this Tesla roof is really badly insulated. But Elon Musk's original uh, big brain idea for uh, heating the solar roof came all the way back in 2016. I mean, really, what smartest man in any room anywhere wouldn't suggest something this stupid? And Dave from EEV Blogs was right there to say counting down until the delusional solar roadways people latch onto Elon Musk's new solar roof as some sort of validation of their glass plus heater. And it didn't take them long either. Yes, seriously, solar roadways uh, were saying that this was a brilliant idea. And this, of course, was long before the whole thing was exposed as uh, largely being a scam. I became skeptical of Tesla in that very moment when I saw him holding up those tiles that I knew were fake. Buffalo was to become sort of the gigafactory of solar panel production. We expect the Buffalo Gigafactory to be a powerhouse of solar panel and solar glass tile output. Well, taxpayers will not like to hear this. It is now a salvage operation at Tesla's Gigafactory in South Park. It is going to be a kick-ass facility. They were supposed to employ originally um, up to 5,000 people um, throughout the area. They were supposed to be for almost 1,500 direct jobs. The state effectively built a factory for Solar City for free in return for a commitment around jobs and productivity out of that factory. And then a number of other support jobs and jobs in the Buffalo area. How many are there? Uh, there are now, I believe, six, around 600 jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, We've made that commitment to the state of New York. We are going to keep that commitment. At the factory, at least $127 million worth of machinery has been identified as surplus. That's in addition to the $50 million in equipment that you may remember was quietly shipped to a wheat field warehouse for storage. It is going to be a kick-ass facility. In total, $177 million. Yes, $177 million of taxpayer-funded gear is no longer needed now by Tesla. It is going to be a kick-ass facility. We can also report that some of that equipment was shredded at a scrapyard. It hasn't been what was imagined at the outset. The state of New York had to write down about a billion dollars from their investments. And that it's gotten got $750 million from the state of New York to really revitalize the economy there. And thus far, it has been, a, let's use the mild word, disappointment. The most important thing that needs to happen is the transition of transportation to electric. The ideal long distance transportation uh, mechanism is a supersonic vertical takeoff and landing electric jet. Thus far, it has been, a, let's use the mild word, disappointment. Um, I think the Hyperloop would be useful, <laughs> but it's really not that hard. It still sounds pretty complicated, Elon. It's like a tube with an air hockey table. It's really, I swear, it's not that hard. <laughs> Thus far, it has been... A SpaceX founder Elon Musk tweeted out Wednesday that he's hoping to land one of his capsules on the surface of Mars in May of 2018. Hmm. That's, that's, that's not that far away. No, that's just a couple of months. Thus far, it has been... Um, and, and this is the feature I like best, thermonuclear explosion-proof glass. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. Thus far, it has been... It didn't go through. Let's so that's a, that's a plus side. Let's try the right. Okay. Try that one, really? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> oh, man. It didn't go through. The loop can hold up to 16 passengers, go 150 miles per hour. Transporting passengers 40 feet underground at about 30 miles per hour. Let's use the mild word disappointment. But he's still one of the world's richest men, right? Well, actually, Elon Musk is rich for the same reason that Elizabeth Holmes was rich. The company that she started at 19 is valued at $9 billion. You own over 50% of it, right? Congratulations on that. <laughs> She was promising the world, and people believed she could deliver, promising that she would revolutionize blood testing. And because of those promises, her company was valued at almost $10 billion. Elon Musk is mostly rich because Tesla is massively overvalued. 
Maybe something to do with him promising that he can sell magic cars that generate $30,000 per year. He's telling you that he's going to sell you a robo taxi for $25,000 that will earn you hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you say, what would be the probable gross profit from a single robo taxi? Um, we think probably something on the order of $30,000 per year. Which does lead to the interesting question if you really could do that, wouldn't it be massively more profitable not to sell the cars? You know, and just stay in business as a robo-taxi company. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! Or maybe, just maybe, he's nothing more than a jumped-up car salesman who will lie to your face without the slightest hint of shame or remorse if that's what it takes to sell one of his cars. The fundamental message that consumers should be taking um, today is that it's financially insane to buy anything other than a Tesla. But I mean, if you take the frenzy stuff off the table and give Tesla a more realistic valuation, more in line with what it actually sells, and you basically knock one to two zeros off the wealth of Elon Musk. But maybe you doubt me. So let me ask this as a serious question to the Elon Musk fans out there. If Elon Musk was so amazingly rich that he really was worth $200 billion. Then I've just got this one question. If Elon Musk's motivations are primarily philanthropic about making mankind a multi-planetary species, why would he worry about the loss of a mere $28 million on a test that would be critical, not just for his space launch company, but his plans to make mankind an interplanetary species. I mean, that would just never happen, right? I mean, for perspective, this would be like a millionaire worrying about spending $20. Yet here he is hand wringing over not wanting to put 28 engines on a booster test. Hopefully we don't lose it. Uh, hopefully we don't lose any boosters because that's a lot of engines. Um, our initial booster flights will just have maybe two to four engines. Um, not 28. <laughs> 28 slot engines. And if you believe SpaceX's numbers, they only cost a million dollars when they were at their most expensive in 2019, with estimates that they're going to cost a quarter of that by the time they're mass producing them. So this loss would cost Elon Musk somewhere between seven and thirty million dollars. If Elon Musk really was worth two hundred billion dollars, he could personally take that loss a hundred times over and still only have spent 1% of his wealth. Hell, if you just take the money that the state of New York gave him, you could do that test 70 times over. So yeah, that's a real question for the Elon Musk fans who still think he's the smartest person in any room anywhere. And please let me know in the comments below what you think of his brilliant idea of using heaters in solar panels to melt the snow off them in winter. And that's today's video. If you enjoyed it, drop a thumbs up on it. Subscribing is always a good option if you don't want to miss out on more videos like this. And as ever, if you really enjoy the content of this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon and uh, thanks for watching.